Porsche's 911 continues to evolve, fundamentally so in the case of this improved 991 series model, where a switch to turbocharging has been made for the entire Carrera lineup. The result is not only vastly improved efficiency, but even more power and torque. Can all of this be delivered, though, without dilution of the magical experience that served this model line so well for so long? And which 911 will suit you best? Rear or four-wheel drive, coupe, soft top, business express or race refugee? Here's where we find out. For more than half a century, there have been sports cars, and then there's been Porsche's 911. Today, you simply wouldn't design a high-performance model of any kind like this. Engine pitched right back, hung over the rear wheels, which is exactly why, since its first appearance back in 1963, there really has been nothing quite like this car. And there probably never will be. Porsche doesn't need to fundamentally change the formula because in its Cayman model, it already offers a more conventional performance coupe. But it does need to finesse it in the face of growing competition from increasingly desirable high performance alternatives from uh, Jaguar, from Mercedes, from Maserati and from Aston Martin. It does need this car the improved version of the 991 series 911. This enhanced range launched here at the very end of 2015. Today, even supercars have to be clean and efficient, which is why every variant in today's 911 range now comes with a turbocharged engine. Now that is significant because before the introduction of the car that we're gonna look at here, this kind of engine was available only in the very priciest 911s. The exotically performing part of the lineup targeted at McLarens and lower order Ferraris. Mainstream 911s in contrast have always been defiantly normally aspirated, no longer. In the continued quest to achieve greater performance along with more efficient returns, even entry-level Carrera models like this one now use abrasive turbines out back. Although, in deference to the continuing top 911 turbo derivative, they don't shout about it in their name. That change has been one of the most fundamental made to the 911 range since the old air-cooled power plants were replaced by more conventional water-cooled engines in 1996. The original version of this seventh generation 991 series represented another landmark in this model line's history. Launched in late 2011 with developments like a new aluminium steel composite construction, a world first seven speed manual gearbox and more efficient electric power steering. Building on that with the introduction of mainstream turbo technology has further refined the 911 proposition. The resulting gains in pulling power and efficiency complemented by design changes both inside and out, plus installation of the kind of upgraded media connectivity that buyers in this segment now insist on. Will it all be enough to allow this car to reclaim an undisputed position as the sharpest driving tool in Porsche's lineup? And will people who've waited all their lives to own one of these feel that they've missed out on the chance to have a real one? It's a tough brief for the most ambitious 911 Stuttgart has ever made. So let's put it to the test. So, to the 911 experience. Quite simply, there's no other car in the world that makes us feel as confident behind the wheel. It could be down to the ideal driving position, uh, the perfectly supportive seat, or the way that the extremities of the car are so easy to place, or a combination of all of that mixed with the adrenaline that goes with the drive in any legendary sports car. Adrenaline that traditionally has been fired in a 911 from the moment that you slot this chunky car-shaped key into the ignition. Will that change with the switch in this revised 991 series model from normally aspirated to twin turbo power? Well, let's see. Yes, perhaps there's slightly less of a snarl on startup than there was before, but in essence, the aural fireworks aren't really any different. There's still that guttural flat six roar that flares briefly and then settles down into the usual pulsing beat. You're ready to go. 
very quickly as it happens, so it's just as well that the brakes as ever are brilliant in if you don't go for the pricey ceramic ones. Now here we're focusing on the first two rungs of the 911 performance ladder, the Carrera and the Carrera S. Each model more powerful than it was before, despite the downsized 3-litre twin-turbo engine that both now use. This, as I've said, the major change with this updated 991 series model. This unit's more efficient, of course, that's why it's here. But the other reason for the switch to turbos for Carrera buyers lies with the vastly improved pulling power that can now be developed. A clever design that uses uh, specially selected compressor wheels within the turbines virtually eliminates the usual slight delay in throttle response that used to characterize turbo units, with the result that this one just pulls like a train in virtually any gear. Does it have all the character of the old, normally aspirated engines? No, not quite. We miss that lovely step up in performance that used to send a shiver down your neck as you crested 4,000 RPM in the previous model, but there's plenty offered in comparison. An extra 60 newton meters of torque for a start, and maximum pulling power that steps in from just 1,700 RPM and sees you through to uh, 7,500 RPM if you're revving to the red line. Here we're trying the standard Carrera, which previously offered 991 series buyers a 3.4 litre unit, developing 350 brake horsepower. Now, with the twin turbo engine, this car has 370 brake horsepower, enough to see 62 miles per hour flash by from rest in as little as 4.6 seconds in this manual model. That's a figure you can reduce to just 4.2 seconds if, like most buyers, you opt for the PDK Auto gearbox and the Sport Chrono pack with its launch control mode. New for this revised model is this driving mode switch, uh, a steering wheel mounted rotary controller that gives you a choice of four settings, normal, sport, sport plus and individual. These alter throttle response, the note of the optional sports exhaust system and the settings of the now standard PASM Porsche Active Suspension Management Adjustable Damping System. Uh, on an automatic model, the modes will alter gear shift timings too, and specifying that PDK box also gives you an extra feature, a sport response button in the centre of the rotary controller. Now when this is pressed, the drivetrain is preconditioned for maximum acceleration for up to 20 seconds in anticipation of an overtaking manoeuvre. Now if this leaves you wondering whether it's really necessary to go beyond this standard Carrera model in the 911 lineup, then we would understand. The facts are though that the majority of customers do still tend to want to find the significant price premium necessary to graduate up to Carrera S ownership. Uh, previously in a 991 series model, the extra cash got you a larger 3.8 litre engine. This time around, buyers get the same 3-litre twin-turbo unit plumbed in out back, though with a software tweak uh, that boosts power to 420 brake horsepower, 20 brake horsepower more than was developed by the old 3.8. Now that's enough to see 62 miles an hour flash by from rest in 4.3 seconds in a manual model, or as little as 3.9 seconds in a variant embellished with that PDK Auto Sport Chrono package. No 911 Carrera variant of any kind has ever previously been able to undercut that magic four second mark. And this one is also capable of lapping Germany's famous Nürburgring Norschleife racetrack in just seven and a half minutes, an impressive 10 seconds quicker than its predecessor. In other words, it's very fast indeed, as you'd expect a Carrera S derivative would be, given stats that quote 500 newton meters of torque and a top speed of as much as 191 miles per hour. Essentially, this variant is now nearly as quick as the exotic 3.8 litre turbo flagship model was in the old pre-2012 997 series 911 lineup. Yes, that fast. Speed, though, is nothing without control, so it's just as well that there's plenty of that on offer. The extent of the assistance varying depending on how you choose to spec up your car. Perhaps the most obvious option is to specify your car in Carrera 4 form with four-wheel drive. A tempting option, given the installation in this improved model of the all-wheel drive system previously used in the top-of-the-range turbo version. This better distributes power more accurately to the wheels that most need it, the result being quite astonishing traction, especially off the line. With or without four-wheel drive, there are plenty of other options on offer to improve the handling of your 911. 
The Sport Chrono package I mentioned earlier includes not only launch control and this centre dash timing gauge, but also what Porsche calls dynamic engine mounts, there to minimise vibrations in the drivetrain, improving both driving stability and comfort. You should also ask your Porsche centre about PDCC, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, standard on the Carrera S and optional on this entry-level model. It's an active roll compensation system that detects the very instant this Porsche begins to roll when cornering, eliminating it almost entirely. Hit a bump mid-corner and the car just shrugs it off and continues on as if nothing had happened. It's almost eerie. Also standard on that S model is PTV, Porsche Torque Vectoring, which uses either a mechanical or an electronically controlled rear differential lock and selectively brakes the inside rear wheel through sharp bends, firing the car on towards the next bend like a bullet from a gun. It's brilliant. With that Carrera S model, you can also add active rear axle steering, which has been adapted from Porsche's 911 GT3 race car for road use. This feature offers you a more direct feeling of corner turning and also improves high speed stability in situations like emergency lane changes. A side benefit of the system is that it reduces the turning circle by half a metre to 10.6 metres, something you'll appreciate when you're manoeuvring in packed city streets. Urban users can also be aided by an optional front axle lift system that raises the nose of the car by 40 millimetres at speeds of up to 21 miles per hour to help you clear those speed bumps more easily. One feature that town-bound 911 owners won't want is the optional sports chassis. This can lower the car by 20 millimetres and comes with an aerodynamics package for reduced lift and extra downforce. Downforce, mind you, is something this car certainly isn't short of. Even on a standard model like this one, there's uh, already 880 newton meters of it, thanks in part to an automatically activating rear spoiler that helpfully alerts police patrols to your speed when it rises at 75 miles an hour and then falls again when the speed drops below 50. Now, I mentioned earlier that all 911s have a distinctive sound. Well, you can embellish that too. In fact, Porsche already has all models feature what's known as a sound symposer, there to emphasize the boxer engine's distinctive sound whenever but only uh, you're in the Sport or Sport Plus modes. Many buyers will want to go even further by specifying the optional sports exhaust system we're trying here with its two double tailpipes. Tap this center console switch and the engine note goes from barnstorming to, uh, well, ballistic. So that as the car tenses itself, every system primed for the challenging road ahead, you do too. But don't infer from all that that this car can't be a quiet, long distance transcontinental express should you need it to be. In fact, the cabin's extra refinement is one of the first things that strikes you about this improved model. That's something you can enjoy safe in the knowledge that that wonderful engine roar is just a prod of your right foot away. A word too about transmission choice. Uh, many buyers will automatically opt for the PDK Paddle Shift Auto Box, but here we've chosen to try the improved manual version just to see if there's still a place for this kind of transmission in the lineup. And there is. This stick shift features no fewer than seven speeds and has been revised to better suit the torquier characteristics of the Carrera's twin turbo engine. A new clutch provides a lighter pedal feel, while a centrifugal pendulum flywheel damps up vibration to make the car smoother to drive. Try it. We think you're going to like it. So far, we've talked only about the Carrera part of the 911 range because that's the widest part of it. Not only because of all the transmission and drive options, but also because of the three-way selection of body styles. If you want an open-roofed alternative to this coupe version, the Cabriolet model remains a popular choice. Plus, if you're interested in a Carrera 4, there's also the option of a Targa variant that delivers the style of a coupe with the al fresco option of an opening convertible roof panel. It's a good compromise. Of course, certain buyers refuse to compromise when it comes to their ideal 911, and if money is no object, then you don't need to. 
these people will be looking at an even faster and more thrilling version of this Porsche, one with uh, speed and exclusivity to properly represent this model line against more exalted six-figure supercars that position themselves well above the Carrera lineup. Contenders like McLaren's 540C and 570S, Audi's second generation R8 V10 and maybe even lower order Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Porsche has always provided a flagship 911 turbo range to go up against contenders like these, and it still does. Today's top model still uses a turbo version of the old 3.8 litre flat six, but more power has been coaxed from it, either 540 or 580 brake horsepower, depending on your choice between standard turbo or turbo S derivatives. Go for the quicker version and 62 miles an hour from rest is just 2.9 seconds away on a dry road with launch control activated through the standard PDK Auto gearbox. Now one day we may look back with astonishment that anyone who was merely rich but hadn't necessarily a shred of driving ability could legally be let loose in something quite so quick. There may be fewer fears on that score with the almost equally expensive 911 GT3 RS variant. This is geared primarily for track use and will be chosen only by expert enthusiasts. Here the 3 litre 6 loses its turbocharging, uh, gets bored out to 4 litres and comes mated to manual transmission. The result is an old school package of performance that offers 500 brake horsepower, enough to see 62 miles an hour flash by in 3.3 seconds en route to 193 miles an hour. If you like the idea of that, but you plan to do a mix of road and track mileage, then the even pricier 911R variant might be a better choice. Here, the same 500 brake horsepower 4 litre engine is almost as quick, but the styling and the driving experience is delivered in a slightly less extreme manner. All very nice, but as we've been saying all the way through, almost all 911 buyers will opt for a Carrera model, hence our emphasis in this film on that part of the range. Try one and you begin to understand just why this Porsche has such a following. There's a feeling of involvement on offer here, only otherwise delivered by the kind of uncompromising track-orientated sports car that you just couldn't use every day. Time and again, brand enthusiasts have worried that necessary changes will dilute the 911 experience. Uh, the switch to water-cooled engines in uh, 1998, the move to electric steering in 2012, now the adoption of twin-turbo technology for Carrera models. None of it, though, has changed the essential appeal of this car, and hopefully nothing ever will. It's easy to assume the styling team for the 911 has the easiest job in the world. After all, essentially the same shape has been used ever since the car was originally launched back in 1963, and that continuity is a big part of its appeal. You certainly know today's model at a glance. It's still the most compact car in its class with the curvy shape and the trademark wide arched wings both present and correct. Look a little closer though and there are plenty of examples of evolution in action, many of them prompted by the installation of that new turbocharged 3 litre engine plumbed in out back. Let's uh, start with that because it's back here that Porsche's designers have had the most work to do. Think it looks very similar to what went before? Well, look again at uh, this engine cover, for example, where the previous horizontal slats have been replaced by the kind of vertical items we saw in much earlier Carrera models. This layout more effective at feeding cool air into the engine. It needs a lot of it, hence the installation of these vents in the lower section of the bumper at either side. They allow hot air from the intercoolers to escape in a way that doesn't interfere with the aerodynamics of the car. And that's why they're positioned low down and as far to each side as possible. Even the adaptive spoiler plays its part here, automatically raising not only for extra aero downforce at high speeds, but also rising in city traffic to more easily feed cooling air into the engine if temperatures start to rise. Aesthetic changes include these smart laser etched LED rear lamp clusters, and in this case anyway, the chrome tipped pair of uh, central tailpipes that come with the optional sports exhaust system. Do without this extra and your 911 will feature two less prominent tailpipes that exit either side of this diffuser style rear under tray. 
There are significant changes at the front too, primarily with headlamps that now incorporate four dual-like LED daytime running lights around the two main bi-xenon bulbs in a look borrowed from Porsche's exotic 918 hybrid supercar. Underneath the main lenses are these thin lighting strips delicately integrated into the shape of the bumper and the curve of the corner air intakes that flank the central number plate and feature three simple black slats. Inside these vents are active flaps that open and close depending on the amount of air needed to cool the car's mechanical components. Uh, this third central intake has a more aesthetic purpose. It's there to give the car a lower, wider look. Move to the side, and if you're already familiar with the original version of this 991 series model, you'll spot fewer changes. The classic profile of this fixed top variant as pure and easily identifiable as it always was. Actually though, the door panels are completely new in a move necessitated by the switch to handles without recessed covers. Other changes include these brighter LED side indicators and some restyled options for the 19 inch, or as in this case, 20 inch wheels used across the range. Cabriolet models feature an electrically operable fabric roof tensioned in an elegant arc from the front window frame to the convertible top compartment. The Targa version, meanwhile, gets a cloth covered central roof segment that lifts and stows under the rear screen in balletic fashion. This variant visually identifiable by thicker door pillars finished with a brushed aluminium trim and a telltale badge. And inside, well, much has changed, yet little seems different. So as ever, you slide behind the wheel to find a traditionally upright dash with an instrument cluster dominated by a large central rev counter flanked by two circular dial spaces on either side. The driving position is low set, of course, but not so much as it would be in a more exotically styled supercar, an Audi R8, uh, a McLaren or a Ferrari, for example. Now, that not only makes it easier to get in and out, but also much easier to see over your shoulder out of the back. Plus, your view forward is far better than it would be in most other serious sports cars, thanks to these relatively slim Alcantara-trimmed front pillars. This general ease of use is what we've always liked so much about the 911. There's no feeling of fear at the thought of urban congestion or tight car parks. So you'll find yourself using this Porsche in daily situations that would see other supercars left languishing the garage. Yet the driving position still manages to be one of the very best when it comes to doing business with a bitumen. Everything is perfectly placed from the angle of the steering wheel and the foot pedals to the tailored positioning of these superbly comfortable leather stitched sports seats. Uh, cabin quality is everything you'd expect from a six-figure supercar and includes lovely details that existing owners will definitely recognise. Uh, things like this digital and analogue stopwatch centrally placed on top of the dash and fitted as part of the optional Sport Chrono package. Uh, less familiar is an addition to this improved model. This well, rather cheap looking rotary control that sits below the right hand spoke of the redesigned steering wheel and allows you to switch between the various driving modes. The other key interior change applies to all 911 models and covers the long overdue infotainment upgrade introduced for this second generation 991 series model. Previously, the central Porsche communication management screen you had to pay extra for incorporated really very little in terms of modern era connectivity. Now, though, there's pretty much everything you could want. Not only is the more intuitive 7-inch touchscreen standard fit, but it also includes a Connect Plus package providing Wi-Fi, internet connection, uh, real-time traffic information, and Google Earth and Google Street View accessibility. The colour monitor offers a kind of swipe and pinch functionality that you'd use on a tablet, and you can draw letters on the display with your fingertips for sat-nav destination input, although it's really easier to do that with uh, the voice control system. There's DAB digital radio, of course, and a USB port or two SD card slots for external devices. Bluetooth is easy to hook up to, and if you're an iPhone user, you can duplicate the functionality of your smartphone onto the display via the Apple CarPlay system. Certain handsets can also be wirelessly charged simply by placing them in this central compartment. What else? Well, earlier I mentioned the classic style of grouped instrument dials that every 911 has used since its model's original debut in 1963. 
I say dials, the readout to the right of the rev counter isn't actually a gauge at all, but instead turns out to be a high resolution multifunction screen that can display anything from a sat nav map to a g-force meter. It's an example of ergonomics that are generally very difficult to criticise. Although below the gear stick on the centre console, Porsche does still persist in using a number of small buttons that can be difficult to read at a glance on the move. Uh, the positioning of the 12 volt charging socket and the passenger footwell isn't ideal either. Uh, the cup holders can also be a bit of a stretch popping out from uh, behind a panel in front of the passenger. Now with most supercars this is where we'd be finishing our tour of the cabin but the 911 has its reputation as the most practical and usable model in its class to uphold. Hence the inclusion of the two small rear seats that you'd have to do without in the brand 718 Cayman and Boxster models and in many rivals. It's yet another thing that makes this car so usable. Yes, it is very cramped back here, but I suppose you put up with it in preference to a rainy walk back from the pub, and two small children would be fine over relatively short distances. There are Isofix seat mountings for them too. Another practical touch is provided by coat hooks placed on the back of the front seat backs, with another two providing the door pillars of uh, coupe models. Bear in mind that if you go for the Targa body style, these back seats are sacrificed to allow the folding roof section to store itself away. The Cabriolet though doesn't suffer this compromise as its hood secretes itself neatly behind the passenger compartment. Much of the time, of course, you'll probably be using these rear pews purely as a stowage point for briefcases or designer shopping bags, some of which might fit in behind the backrests where there's a 150 litre compartment. Fold the backrest forward and you have a total of 260 litres of room to use. Which is important given that, as with any supercar, trunk space is at a bit of a premium. The mid-engine configuration of Porsche's 718 Boxster and Cayman models frees up space for the rear boot compartment. But of course, with this twin turbo uh, three litre six slung out back here, you don't get that with a 911. That means that anything you can't fit inside therefore has to go into this compartment beneath the sculpted bonnet. Now whichever body style you choose, this boot out front is 145 litres in size, or at least it is in a two-wheel drive variant like this one. Bear in mind that the capacity falls to just 125 litres if you go for a four-wheel drive model. At least this compartment is deep, which makes it large enough to swallow a typical carry-on flight case. Tucked in here too is an emergency warning triangle and a get you home puncture repair kit. Ultimately though, you can't really make the most of what's on offer here unless you pay extra for the tailored 911 luggage set. Is a 911 good value for money? Well, that depends on your perspective. There'll always be lesser brands offering sports cars that look similarly quick, but there's something about the depth of engineering and the history of this car that sets it apart. As before, buyers in the most affordable segment of the range choose between Carrera and Carrera S models that now share the same three litre six cylinder turbo engine. For a Carrera like this one, with that engine in 370 brake horsepower guys, prices were pitched from launch from a starting point of just under £77,000. So think in terms of an £80,000 budget once you've allowed for a few well-chosen extras. To put it another way, you're looking at having to find around £30,000 more than you have to spend to get yourself the next model down in the Porsche hierarchy, the comparably performing 350 brake horsepower 718 Cayman S. And that might take a bit of thinking about. Those who really want a 911 though tend not to be satisfied with anything else. In fact, many of them find a way to spend even more and get themselves the Carrera S variant with its 420 brake horsepower output, a derivative that costs around £9,500 more than the base version. That meant pricing from launch pitched at around £86,000, but with a few options, a typical Carrera S buyer will almost certainly be looking at paying the best part of £90,000. 
Now, if budget permits, you're also going to want to look at the four-wheel drive versions of both of those models. The extra traction offered at a premium of around £5,000. And that meant that from launch, a Carrera 4 was priced at just under £82,000, while the Carrera 4S was pitched from around £92,000. Whichever derivative you decide upon, your dealer will offer you the option of PDK paddle shift automatic transmission for just under £2,400 more. An extra feature that nearly 70% of buyers choose. So much for the fixed top proposition onto the other body styles. Now you can choose a cabriolet version of any of the variants I just mentioned at a premium of just under £9,000, which means a 911 cabriolet pricing span in the £85,000 to £100,000 bracket. If you're prepared to focus in on four-wheel drive, there's the additional alternative of a Targa variant with removable roof panels. Again, the premium over an equivalent fixed top model is around £9,000. So for a 911 Targa 4, or a Targa 4S, think in terms of a £90,000 to £100,000 pricing span. Going further requires a big step up in price that takes you into the upper, more exotic section of the 911 lineup. That targeted at McLarens and lower order Ferraris rather than more mainstream sports cars like Jaguar F types and Maserati GTs. Now, in this upper market segment, the 911 offers uh, two main options. If you're buying with track day use in mind, you want to look at the two circuit orientated fixed top rear driven models that use the brand's older 500 brake horsepower, 4 litre, normally aspirated flat six engine. Select either the 911 GT3 RS, priced from just over £131,000, or the 911R, priced from around £138,000. If, on the other hand, you're after the ultimate 911, but predominantly want to drive it on public roads, then you'll be better off with one of the full-fat top turbo models. These add twin turbos to the old 3.8-litre flat six and come only with four-wheel drive. Select either the 540 brake horsepower 911 Turbo, priced from around £127,000, or the 580 brake horsepower 911 Turbo S, priced from around £146,000. In either case, there's the option of finding just under £9,000 more to get your car with a cabriolet body style. So, lottery winners, form an orderly queue. So, now you know your 911s, if you didn't already. What about the value proposition compared to obvious rivals? Well, in terms of the Carrera variants, the car we always used to mention as the closest alternative was Audi's R8, but that's now been moved up into a higher, more exalted price bracket, leaving, well, what to take on this car in the 80 to 100,000 pounds lower order supercar segment? Well, nothing really that's quite the same. A Nissan GTR is a little quicker, but it's no longer much cheaper. It'll cost far more to run and will depreciate rapidly. A V8 supercharged Jaguar F-Type is another option, and that's priced very similarly to a Carrera S, but the prodigious weight of its 5-litre engine means it's really no quicker, despite an extra 130 brake horsepower of power. So what else? Uh, well, around £82,000 would buy you either a Mercedes SL500 or a Maserati Gran Turismo, but in both cases, you're getting more of a Grand Tourer than a fearsome sports car. To some extent, the same is also true of an Aston Martin V8 Vantage or a BMW M6, and they're both priced close to £95,000. So much for the Carrera variants, uh, but can this model line's brand equity really be stretched further, right up into exotic Ferrari and McLaren territory? Well, if you agree with Porsche that it can, then you're going to see the top turbo models as being reasonably well priced. Yes, if you're looking at a 540 brake horsepower 911 turbo, there are cheaper, comparably performing options. A Mercedes AMG SL63, for example, would save you around £10,000. That car wouldn't match this Porsche for driving pleasure, though. It'd be better in that regard to go for the Mercedes AMG GTS, around £15,000 less than the Line 11 Turbo, or an Audi R8 V10, around £5,000 less. Neither car, though, is quite as quick as its 911 equivalent. Another good match for a potential 911 Turbo buyer lies with McLaren's 540C, priced identically, but again a fraction slower. If you're prepared to stretch further and move on up into 911 Turbo S ownership, then the alternatives get more exotic. That model's £145,000 asking price is the same as you pay for a McLaren 570S, but again, the Woking built alternative is a fraction slower against the clock. Both these two will save you plenty over the exclusive Italian opposition. 
in a Lamborghini Huracan or a Ferrari 488 GTB, you'd go no faster and find yourself paying 35 to 40,000 pounds more. Enough with spec and comparisons. Let's say you've decided nothing but a 911 will do. Now, if having done that, you were to turn to the spec sheet and then find it necessary to have to spend a fortune on the kind of extra cost features that you would expect at this level, we could understand how you'd be left feeling frustrated. And that was often the case previously when it came to 911 ownership. But is it still true here? Well, let's find out. At first glance, things seem promising. Even an entry-level Carrera model like this one gets 19-inch alloy wheels with four piston brake calipers, along with bi-xenon headlamps, LED rear lamps, and an auto-deploying rear spoiler. This improved turbocharged model also gets, as standard, a steering wheel-mounted driving mode rotary controller that allows you to alter the throttle response and the stability control thresholds. It also manages the reactions of the PDK Auto gearbox and the sports exhaust system, if you had those fitted. Uh, these driving modes also tweak the damping thanks to the fact that the brand's PASM Porsche Adaptive Suspension Management System with its choice of either normal or sport modes is now standard on all models. Now, that used to be an expensive extra. Now, it wasn't long ago that you had to pay a lot more for leather upholstery too, but that's now standard. Trimming front sport seats featuring electrical adjustment for both rake and height, although you do have to use your muscles to move them back and forward. Another feature previously listed as a pricey extra, but these days fitted as standard, is the Central Dash Porsche Communication Management Infotainment Monitor. Now you can pinch, swipe and tap its seven inch touchscreen to access satellite navigation with real time traffic updates and a DAB audio system with eight speakers. The setup now works with Apple CarPlay so that iPhone users can duplicate the functionality of their handsets onto that display. As you'd expect, you can also connect in devices like iPods and there's Wi-Fi access too. Plus you can connect into Google Earth and Google Street View if you need to. There are also various Connect apps, and you can even wirelessly recharge your phone and boost its signal by putting it in the lidded cubby between the front seats. Are there any further gains if you graduate up to the extra power of a Carrera S model? Well, yes, there are a few. We're surprised that Porsche still doesn't fit its torque vectoring system as standard on base Carrera models. You have to pay extra for that on a car like the one we're testing here. But that setup is standard if you go for a Carrera S, and it's there to enhance traction during hard acceleration and cornering. Other Carrera S standard additions include bigger 20-inch wheels fitted with larger 350mm front brake discs and red six-piston calipers. Plus, you get a pair of stainless steel double-pipe exhausts. All 911s get a Porsche vehicle tracking anti-theft system and, as with all the brand's models, new buyers get a complimentary driving course at the company's experience centre at Silverstone. On to options. Well, we'd certainly also want this car's sports exhaust system and, like most 911 buyers, we'd pay extra for the Sport Chrono package too. This adds dynamic engine mounts and a centre dash stopwatch. In addition, if you've opted for a PDK automatic model, the Sport Chrono option also gives you launch control. Plus, that mode switch will feature a sport response button that preconditions the drivetrain for maximum acceleration over 20 seconds for swift overtaking. Uh, that'll be nice to have, especially for track day fiends, who will also want to consider the very pricey Porsche carbon ceramic brakes for the ultimate in stopping power. If you've stretched to a Carrera S, then you'll be able to pay extra for Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control to reduce body roll in corners. That's a feature that must be brought along with rear axle steering that helps the car turn into bends more crisply. And also comes with a useful side effect of being able to reduce the turning circle by half a metre. That'll be of interest to urban-based 911 owners, as will the optional front axle lift system that jacks up the body by 40 millimetres to help it over speed bumps at speeds of up to 21 miles an hour. These people will also be interested in the Power Steering Plus feature that reduces the effort that's needed to turn the wheel at low speeds or when you're parking. What else? Well, there's a PDLS Porsche Dynamic Light System that adapts your headlights to road and weather conditions. Now, with this car, that setup has been further upgraded to include LED headlights fitted with the Porsche Dynamic Light System Plus package, which offers speed-sensitive headlight range control. 
As for other things, uh, well, almost unbelievably, you have to pay extra for a rear wiper. Seat heating and cruise control really ought to be standard too. A park assist with reversing camera setup also costs more, and you can specify automatically dimming mirrors with an integrated rain sensor. A smaller diameter GT steering wheel might tempt you. An electric sunroof can be ordered in steel or glass, while above it, a roof box can be attached for extra cargo capacity. The Porsche entry and drive package would also be nice to have, uh, giving you keyless entry if you've got the key in your pocket. Uh, we would want to look at one of the audio options too. The Sound Package Plus gives you 150 watts of volume, but it's much better to try and stretch to one of the 12-speaker surround sound packages. The Bose setup offering 555 watts and the high-end Burmester system boosting that to a thumping 821 watts. You'll also need to get your seat spec right. Those at the front can be ventilated with cool air as well as heated. This car has the Sport Seats Plus package with four-way electric adjustment and bigger bolsters that better keep you in place when you're driving hard. Alternatively, an adaptive Sport Seats Plus package adds memory function to the power adjustment and also gives you powered steering column movement. Lightweight sports bucket seats are another option targeted at track day types. Uh, we'd also want to take up the option Porsche offers of personally collecting your car from the factory. On to aesthetics. Now there's a whole range of options available via the Porsche exclusive personalization program. Things like privacy glass, uh, painted side skirts and black trimming for the headlights, the tailpipes and the door mirrors, just to give you a few examples. You might want the model designation of your 911 variant painted on the door in black too. As for the main bodywork colour, well, if you don't like the basic white, yellow, red or black paint choices, then you're going to want to peruse the wide range of metallic options. Porsche has also introduced a number of brighter shades with this revised model if you really want to stand out. There are plenty of alloy wheel choices too, and you may want your chosen rims to be finished in gloss black. Inside, there's a wide range of cabin customization options with extras like inlays in carbon fiber, aluminium, or high quality wood. You can also get contrast stitching for leather upholstery that can be supplied in different colors. In fact, hide can cover almost everything from the seatbelt buckles to the dashboard if you want it to. The finishing touch would be the light design package, which fills the cabin with dimmable LEDs for a unique nighttime ambiance. Finally, we'll tell you about safety provision. All mainstream 911 models come with twin front side and curtain airbags integrated as part of the Porsche side impact protection system. You also get tire pressure monitoring, the usual braking aids and PSM, Porsche Stability Management Traction Control. This improved 911 features an extra PSM sport setting, which allows the driver to throw the car around a little more without intervention, yet keeps the safety net in place should ambition get the better of your talent. There's also a post-collision braking system that will automatically brake the car after you've hit something, helping to prevent further impacts. Uh, Isofix child seat mounts are fitted to both rear seats, but getting an Isofix fastening fitted to the front passenger seat will cost you extra. Want to go further? Well, you could upgrade the optional cruise control system to one featuring radar-driven adaptive technology, so your 911 will automatically maintain a safe distance for the car in front at speeds between 18 and 130 miles an hour. Lane change assist is another extra that warns you if you're drifting out of lane at highway speeds. There's also a speed limiter indicator that recognizes traffic signs and shows them on the central Porsche communication management display. It would have been disappointing if Porsche had gone to all the trouble of fundamentally changing the engineering of this car only for the fuel and emission benefits to be marginal. Fortunately, that is not the case. The 911 is often referred to as an affordable supercar and that's never been truer than it is today. Think about what you might buy in preference to a Carrera, uh, a Nissan GTR, a V8 supercharged Jaguar F-Type, a Maserati Gran Turismo, a BMW M6, 
Aston Martin V8 Vantage, whatever. In every case, the official government figures struggle to better 25 miles per gallon on the combined cycle, and the CO2 returns will be getting up towards a smoky 250 grams per kilometre. Now, compare that to this 911, which in rear-driven standard Carrera form with a PDK Auto gearbox manages 38.2 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 169 grams per kilometre of CO2. That, by the way, compares with 34.4 miles per gallon uh, and 194 grams per kilometre for the equivalent version of this 991 series model in its original, normally aspirated form, itself a big improvement on what went before. In overall terms, we're looking at running costs for Carrera models being about 12% better than they were before. Inevitably, almost all of this gain is down to the new twin-turbo power plant that's been fitted out back, but the added active aerodynamics and incorporated uh, start-stop engine technology also play their part. As a result, a Carrera PDK model's 64-litre fuel tank could potentially take you up to 538 miles between fill-ups. Just bear in mind the efficiency caveats that apply to different derivatives. Uh, for a start, the PDK Auto gearbox makes this car significantly cleaner and more frugal. If, in preference, you go for the manual stick shift version we're trying here, figures for the standard Carrera fixed top model fall to 34 miles per gallon and 190 grams per kilometer. At least there's not too much of a running cost penalty for enjoying the extra 50 brake horsepower you get with the Carrera S. The manual version of that car delivers 32.5 miles per gallon and 199 grams per kilometre, while the PDK Auto helps to improve those numbers to 36.7 miles per gallon and 174 grams per kilometre. If you're worried that going for the all-wheel traction of a Carrera 4 model will dramatically damage those figures, then don't be. Reckon on a deficit of only around 5%, so a Carrera 4 with PDK transmission, for example, will still be able to return 36.7 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 177 grams per kilometer of CO2. Regardless of your choice of drive layout across the Carrera lineup, if you prefer either the Cabriolet or the Targa body styles, your fuel and CO2 returns will only be fractionally affected. Of course, the older engines used in the more exotic models further up the 911 range cost considerably more to run. The 3.8 litre unit found in the auto only 540 or 580 bhp turbo models deliver 31 miles per gallon and 212 grams per kilometre of CO2 regardless of your choice of engine output. Go for the 4 litre version of this unit found in the GT3 RS and 911R variants and the figures will take an even bigger hit. In the GT3 you're looking at 22.2 miles per gallon and 296 grams per kilometre, while in a 911R the figures are 21.2 miles per gallon and 308 grams per kilometre. So ouch. Back though to the real world and the Carrera range, which continues its strong efficiency showing when it comes to questions of routine servicing and maintenance. Uh, there's a wider dealer network that many rivals can offer, and you'll only need to visit your local Porsche centre every two years or every 20,000 miles, whichever comes first. Uh, there's no option to buy into a prepaid servicing package at point of purchase, but the brand does provide a fixed price servicing approach that makes sure you'll know in advance exactly what work will be carried out and what it's going to cost. All models are covered by a three-year unlimited mileage warranty package that's unsurpassed for this type of car and the 911 also has 12 years of corrosion cover and a three-year paint guarantee. Insurance for a car of this power and performance is never going to be cheap, but a Group 47 rating for the Carrera Coupe we have here is lower than for most of its rivals. Opting for the faster S model will move that up to Group 48, while the four-wheel drive versions of each sit two groups higher than their rear-wheel drive siblings. Go beyond the Carrera lineup into the top segment of the 911 range and, as you'd expect, every model is rated at Group 50. Now, when you decide to sell on your car, you'll find that this Porsche's heritage and reputation will help shore up its value. You can expect any Carrera model to retain around 43% of its new price. To give you some perspective, that's notably better than the 35% figure that you get for a comparable Jaguar F-Type. The 911. 
Whether you have a classic model or this improved seventh generation variant, it's an automotive icon that's globally loved, with nearly a million cars sold worldwide over six decades, 80% of which are still on the road. Which is why, though in this version, Porsche has taken one of the biggest steps forward that this model line has ever seen, the company hasn't messed with the fundamental formula. In other words, if, like us, you've always loved this car, then you'll love this one. There are surely lots of reasons to. The Carrera's new six-cylinder twin turbo is efficient, yet sonorous and gloriously tractable. Plus, the cabin's more up-to-date and the infotainment's been brought up to scratch. In addition, like its predecessor, this 911 is practical and easy to use and remains satisfying to drive in a way that rivals just can't quite match. Of course, there are some downsides. It's certainly not the cheapest contender in its class, and Porsche still demands that you spend a fair bit on options if you're to get the car of your dreams. The result will be an asking for you that will take the car even further clear of the brand's Cayman model, a coupe some used to tell us was better to drive thanks to its mid-engine layout. That's no longer such an issue these days, though, thanks to the way that the Cayman switch into four-cylinder power has set this 911 back into its rightful place at the top of the company's sporting hierarchy. In summary, what we have here is a worthy evolution of the world's longest running sports car dynasty. Porsche is banking on the fact that the excellence of this 911 will help to simplify the decision over whether to commit to the significant outlay involved in buying it. If over 50 years of development has taught us anything, it's that you wouldn't bet against them succeeding in doing just that.